All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, today is October 20th, and we're going to pick up where we left off. I want to remind everybody, I want to just make sure that everybody remembers that we are in Module 4 right now, and Quiz 4 opens this Thursday, and it has to be taken by Sunday at 8 o'clock. You know the drill on that. Also, the discussions in Module 4 are due Friday at 8 o'clock as well. So make sure that we, that we stay up with that. As always, we're not going to cover all of the material in Module 4 in these lectures. And so study that material. Look at all of it. It is all very important. Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of the Jackson years. And when we left off, we were talking about Jackson's view of the federal government. And in many ways, he supported the ideology of Thomas Jefferson, who argued for a small federal government, very little federal spending on things like internal improvements, a federal government that didn't support things like banking and industry, even though those are drivers of the economy, because those also are drivers of corruption. You know, Jackson wanted a nation of small farmers, just like Jefferson did in a you know, very limited foreign policy, very limited taxation. And we talked last time about how something as simple as building a federal road could introduce all types of corruption, because where does the road go? Who pays for it? Uh, what kind of grifting can take place, et cetera, et cetera. And if this becomes major, if this becomes a standard part of how our government works, well, we might very well lose our democracy. We might very well lose the influence of the people. Well, we're not going to stop progress in terms of internal improvements. We're not going to stop a revolution that is taking place beginning in the 1820s, a little earlier, and it will carry through, I guess, all the way up to the present era in some ways, and that is the transportation revolution and the revolution in big engineering and big construction. By the 1820s over in Europe, for example, we now start to see uh, railroads moving along. We are beginning to see steamboats. We are beginning to see much more modern ports, canals, etc. And that is going to be filtering over into the United States. The first big infrastructure project in the United States connected the Great Lakes to the Hudson River. And you may have heard of this before. I hope you have. This is the Erie Canal. This is the Erie Canal. You see, the Midwest, and I don't have a good map here, unfortunately. Well, this will work, yeah. Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. There's a lot of good farmland here. There's a lot of good crops that can be raised and livestock that can be raised. And all of this can be moved all along those Great Lakes. But of course, there's no place to go if that's all you're going to do. And moving goods by water is vastly more efficient than moving goods by land. Now, if you look here, over in New York, there is a bridge of land between the eastern section of Lake Ontario and the Hudson River. And this is roughly 364 miles. This is roughly 364 miles. It's sort of that line right there. In the early 19th century, some engineers started looking at that land and came to the conclusion that a canal was feasible. We could link Lake Ontario to the Hudson River. Yes, it is 364 miles, but for the most part, it's flat land. It isn't particularly complicated. A whole bunch of men with a whole bunch of shovels can dig a trench. It can be done. And if it were to succeed, it would revolutionize agriculture in the Midwest because it would link by water these western states. You know, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, etc. could ship their crops out of New York 
without ever having to touch land. You could put them on a boat in Chicago, for example, and it could hit the Atlantic Ocean if there was a canal across New York. Now, the critics, of course, would look at this and say, you're talking about digging a 364-mile trench. That's going to take a lot of digging. That's going to take a lot of shovels. That's going to take a lot of money. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Yes, digging, digging a trench from Lake Ontario, 364 miles, all the way over there to the Hudson River. It's also going to be crazy expensive. You're going to have to pay all of these men all of for all of the work that they do. Well, investors got together, privately raised the money, because, of course, we're going to charge people to go across this canal. And between 1817 and 1825, sure enough, they did it. Four feet deep and eight feet wide, 364 miles, and it will be called the Erie Canal. And here is a better look at it. And it goes roughly from Buffalo to Albany. It goes roughly from Buffalo to Albany. Following the natural contours of the land, there's actually a couple of places where they had to install some primitive locks. And during the entire time, everybody thought this thing is going to be a bust. There's no realistic way this thing can succeed. Come on, get real. But sure enough, it didn't just succeed. It was a smash success. The cost of moving goods from the Midwest or, you know, what they would just simply call the West, the cost of moving those goods to the Atlantic Ocean just collapsed overnight. It became so much cheaper, which opened up so much more land for agriculture. The investors in the Erie Canal profited quite handsomely. And the early Erie Canal was really quite primitive. You know, they just developed these sort of simple flat bottom boats. They were pulled by mules on the side of the road. You know, I mean, you know, on the side there, and you just, you know, pull it 364 miles and get it on the Hudson River. It caused New York City to grow exponentially. All of a sudden, New York City is exporting more than any other city in the United States, with the exception, perhaps, of New Orleans. You know, New York City is now exporting all of that stuff. So New York City becomes the Big Apple as a result of this. It was already a big city. Now it is a major, major center. And, of course, with all of these goods coming in and out, New York City becomes a major financial center because this is where the goods are bought and this is where the goods are sold. Agents from Europe, of course, started setting up in New York City to buy these crops and buy this pro this, this, these produce, uh, the, these products. So New York City becomes New York as a result of the Erie Canal. And it's still around today, just in case you're wondering. The Erie Canal. Uh, well, 1817 to 25, so it was eight years. And again, just huge crews of men uh, give them shovels and dig the trench. Uh, that's all it is. You know, that's it. And there was a lot of, you know, there were canal building endeavors going on. At the same time, we're seeing the construction of the Suez Canal, which connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. And that means that shipping now doesn't have to go around Africa. It can just go straight into the Indian Ocean. And the Suez Canal is far more influential than the Erie Canal. And there's also talk about the big one, the mother of all canals, and that is connecting the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Panama Canal, which, of course, would eventually get built, but it's going to be 100 years, 90 years, before the Panama Canal gets built. And it got started and stopped, and that was a marvel of engineering. That was considerably more difficult than any of these because they had to go through a mountain range. So, But anyway, what the Erie Canal is going to do is set off a huge canal-building boom and it does get widened over the years. It gets improved and made bigger. But it shows infrastructure matters. Infrastructure transforms economies. And here it is today. It's still, like I said, it's still around. You know, it's a lot bigger than it used to be. And today it's just used for pleasure crafts. It's not used for commerce anymore. Uh, but it's still, it's still a thing. And in Upper New York, they're awful proud of it. Now, also, what it's going to do is it's going to transform all of those towns and communities 
in Upper New York. They're going to grow in population. They're going to get a lot of economic activity and a lot of economic boost as a result of that. We'll see just an awful lot happening up there, if you get my meaning, because the Erie Canal starts bringing people in. And so it's reminding people if a, if a major thoroughfare goes through your community, you're going to make a lot of money. Property values will increase. Business will increase, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want that, push for it. And this is going to be a big reason why the internal improvement debate happens. Because the Erie Canal was such a success, everybody is saying, okay, the federal government now needs to get involved. Uncle Sam needs to start building canals and roads and such. And Andrew Jackson says, no, right, we don't want this. This is a bad idea. Yes, we want these things, but they needed to be funded by the states or privately. The federal government needs to stay out of it. But you can see that. We also, of course, see steamboats. Everybody in here knows what a steamboat is, but steamboats are also going to play a huge role in transforming the economy during this era. The first steamboats emerged in the early 1800s, but they were primitive. Put a big steam engine on a boat. The rivers of, of North America are remarkable and, and, and vast, and you can move huge amounts of product down them, but it's real hard to move the, move the boats back up because, of course, rivers flow in one direction. And so it's easy to get stuff to New Orleans. It's really hard to get stuff from New Orleans. So with steamboats, you can power your way back up the Mississippi River and later the Tennessee River and Ohio River and all the tributaries that go along with it. And so by the 1820s, we're starting to see steamboats. And, of course, an entire culture emerges along the various tributaries of the Mississippi and the Mississippi itself as all of these all of these river towns are places where business is done and you know all types of characters show up, et cetera, et cetera. Steamboats were dangerous. Steamboats were frequently overloaded because the more stuff you put on them, the more, uh, the more money you can make. And so the boilers on these steamboats would often explode under the enormous pressure of moving all of the goods. The worst naval disaster in American history, the most deadliest, the most terrible that we have ever had was the explosion of the Sultana after the Civil War. You know, uh, uh, you know well over 2,000 Union veterans in 1865 were loaded on, on the steamboat Sultana to move back up the river north. And a lot of them had been prisoners of war, but far too many of them were crammed on the boat, and the boiler was a little bit defective, and it overloaded and kaboom, and blew up and, and killed something like 1,400 of them. It was just a horrible, horrible to, uh, uh, occurrence. But that actually happened from time to time. Of course, there's other problems with steamboats. They can run aground and stuff like that. But, but they're, they're going to be a big, a big part of our economic growth. We're also going to see railroads. We put those steam engines in front of a bunch of cars and lay down the track. And everybody knows what a railroad is. Yeah, it's very primitive. This is, you know, these are primitive locomotives. These aren't the, the, the steam locomotives that we're familiar with. But, you know, these are the early versions. And what you have to keep in mind is that these can pull so much more than horses ever could, and they don't get tired. And we have abundant iron in this country. We have abundant coal in this country. We can, we can do this. The first railroad in the United States was introduced in 1830. Now, they had already been used over in Europe for a few years prior to this. And they had been used for industrial purposes. For example, uh, pulling coal out of coal mines was where it was the first steam engines on rails were used for that. But eventually they'll start hauling people, start hauling goods. By the year 1860, by the year 1860, there are 31,000 miles of track across the United States. The majority of it is north of the Ohio River. The north tends to have a lot more rail infrastructure than the south because there's more capital, more industry, more development, and so there's more of a need for it. And when the Civil War does break out, the lack of railroads in the south is going to play a big role in the south's losing. You know, the Union really can utilize the rail in ways that the South can't, so it's a big deal. And some cities didn't want them. Charleston, South Carolina, for example, made railroads illegal. You couldn't have trains going in and out because they're loud and they belch a lot of smoke and 
they're uh, you know unpleasant in a lot of ways. And so Charleston, South Carolina actually declined in a lot of ways because it didn't have the advantage of, of having a train go in and out. The people were rather short-sighted in understanding the, the, the benefit. We will see steamboats, canals, railroads just cause an absolute revolution in commercial agriculture. Millions of acres are now accessible to foreign markets because you can load them on a train or load them on a steamboat. You know, before this might be great land, but it's in the middle of nowhere. You know, I can grow all the crop I want, but where's it, where am I going to send it? You know, what am I going to do with it? Right? I can't, you know, I don't have enough horses to haul it all the market, right? So now that we have trains and steamboats and stuff, I can just grow huge amounts of corn or wheat or cotton or pigs or whatever and, you know, just ship them out. It, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. We will see products emerge that make fields more productive. We'll see products emerge that make fields more productive. One of which is the mechanical reaper. The first version of this was introduced in 1831. This is a later version. A man by the name of Cyrus McCormick invented this. Now, what is a reaper? Well, a reaper is a device that cuts down stalks of wheat. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, a, a hand reaper is really just an arc blade. And you just, you know, everybody's seen the grim reaper, right? You know, the you know, the, you know, death with the, with the finger and the, that thing that he's holding, that scythe. Well, what that does is it cuts down the wheat. You know, you just go through the field and you chop it down. Well, that's hard work. You know, it's difficult. It wears you out. A mechanical reaper can be pulled by horses and it just automatically cuts down the wheat. It can do the work of dozens of men pulled by a couple of horses. And so you can grow a lot more wheat as a farmer and know that you will be able to harvest it in time. We will also see the invention of the steel plow by a man named John Deere. Steel, as we know, is tougher, lighter, far superior to iron, even though steel is iron. It's iron with oxygen in it. And a steel plow cuts the earth better. It lasts longer. It's easier to use. And so in 1837, John Deere introduces the first steel plow. You know, around the year 1000, the iron plow was introduced in Europe, and it revolutionized European agriculture, and now we're going from iron to steel, which is even better. So now we're seeing so much more produced. Now, we know also, of course, that if you can sell any crop you grow, if you're going to just be able to just abundantly produce from your land, you want more land, don't you? If the more land you have, the more money you make is the deal, you want more land. And so this is going to put a lot more pressure on Western development, a lot more pressure on westward movement, and that means more pressure on Native Americans. The Native tribes that were living west of the Appalachian Mountains are going to see more and more encroachment on their territory. So what's going on with this? Well, we mentioned this earlier, but I want to remind you, in the South, there were what was called then, not so politically correct today, the five civilized tribes. And we discussed these before. They are the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. Those are the five major tribes in what we call the American South. Now, there are different branches of these. These are tribal groups. For example, the Choctaw, the Muscogee, and the Natchez are, are, are connected to the Choctaw. So it isn't quite that simple, but there we go. Up north, there were the Sauk and the Fox tribes. And they're sitting on land people want, as in white people. Now, after the War of 1812, treaties and agreements were signed with these tribes, giving them large sections of land with the hope that these people would become farmers themselves. 
that they would just simply Americanize, if you get my meaning, begin to become part of the modern American economy, become farmers and get the Indian out of the Indian, if you, if, if you get where I'm coming from. Again, not to be politically correct, of course. And for the most part, by the 18 teens, these tribes had come to accept the fact that they could not maintain their indigenous way of life. You know, it was, it was over. You know, the white people had won. They were not going to live as their ancestors did. If they were going to survive as a people, they were going to have to modernize and begin to become the farmers that the white people were being. One group that did a very good job of this were the Cherokee. You know, the Cherokee are probably the best known Native American tribe. It seems like everybody who thinks they have Native American ancestry seems to think they're Cherokee. The Cherokee always point this out, right? It's generally not true, but the Cherokee had formed a democratic government. They would eventually develop a written version of their language. They would even have newspapers. By the 18 teens, they are a peaceful people and they want to be farmers. They want to participate in this growing economy and, as we would say, modernize. But others were doing the same thing. Here's the problem. There's two problems. Number one, they are sitting on really good farmland. That's problem number one. Good for them. In the larger context, you can already see why that's going to be a bit of an issue. Secondly, they are weaker and they are now under the subjugation of a culture that just does not really see them as equal. This is where things get to be a lot more complicated than the popular narrative teaches. Everybody in here knows that their land was stolen from them and they were forced along the Trail of Tears. Everybody's already heard of that. I'm sure you have. And that's certainly true. Nobody's saying that didn't happen. Here's the problem. There's more than one entity at play here. There's more than one entity at play. The federal government, the government in Washington, D.C., does not want conflict with the Indians anymore. You know, if you talk to the leaders in Washington, they will say, we don't want to fight these people. We want them to become farmers. We want them to become affluent and prosperous. And we want them, again, to quote, unquote, Americanize. Now, we can certainly agree that there's a degree of bigotry in there whenever we say they need to abandon their indigenous culture and become like everybody else. But the point was that you know, we don't want conflict and we don't want to steal their land, et cetera, et cetera. Once you go on to the frontier, once you go into the regions where these natives live, the farmers and the communities want that land. They see those Indians living on that land and they say, we want it. And the more crop I grow, the more money I make. And in order for me to get land, I have to buy it from the federal government. But if I move on to the Indian land and I just carve out my little section and I squat it out and I improve it and I start growing crops there, who's really going to stop me? What's really going to happen? The Indians now know they can't attack me. They attack me. It's bad news for them. They're smart enough to get that. And so we start seeing local encroachment on Indian land. And the Indians are now contacting the government saying, you know, you promised us this land and you said you would keep the white people off and we're turning around and more and more of these squatter farms are popping up. And you leaders promised that wouldn't happen. Well, what happens back in Washington, D.C., whenever the reports come in that all these squatters are taking the land? Well, think about this for a minute. You're a senator from Tennessee, and you're a senator from Georgia, and you're getting reports from the natives who do not vote and do not pay taxes that all these white people are showing up on that land. Well, who does vote the white people on that land? right? Who are your neighbors? Who are your friends? Who are the people that you grew up with? The white people sitting on that land, right? Who are the 
soldiers, if you will, that will have to force the squatters off the land. Well, the very white people that are squatting on that land. You see what I'm saying? So if you are a senator or a congressman or somebody in Washington with influence, there's really not a lot you can do about it, is there? White, what's that? It's, it's a lot easier to just let those white people squat on that Indian land and not do anything about it. Because the minute you start trying to forcibly evict farmers from land they had cleared and land they are producing and land that they are living on, the minute you start kicking them off those farms is the minute you get voted out of office. Now, you're doing the right thing by kicking squatters off. You're doing the right thing by forcing those farmers to respect land rights. But hey, you got to stand for election, don't you? Now, you go to the people of Tennessee or Georgia or Alabama and say, I kicked a bunch of white people off that native savage land. Vote for me. You see where I'm coming from? So Washington is in a dilemma. Washington is in a big dilemma. It doesn't want this squatting to take place. It's powerless to stop it. So the easier solution is to just let it keep happening. You see, the easier solution is to just not stress about it. And there is debate. I've read the letters. Among these communities, there are plenty of settlers that are saying, stop, stop stealing from the Indian land. Stop, you know, stop doing this. But you see, you're a farmer. You've got your land. You're making your money. You've got a nice house to live in. You're doing great. You know, every year you're producing more and more wheat, which gives you more and more money to buy more and more land, right? You're a young farmer. You don't have any land. You haven't been able to come as, as prosperous as him. You see where I'm coming from? So he doesn't want conflict with the Indians, and he's perfectly happy to respect their land. You're like, I think I'm going to go over there. I think I'm going to clear that Indian land. And so the communities are divided over this. You see where I'm coming from? And you know what? You're friends with him, right? You don't really like the Indians either. You think they're a bunch of savages, right? You've heard those stories and you, you know, you remember the tales of the scalpings and all of that. And so you say, you know what? What's the worst that can happen here? Okay, they're a nice family. They've set up a farm. They've cleared the land. Why is it so terrible that those Indians are keeping it wooded whenever we can grow wheat on it? You see where I'm coming from? It's not just a singular voice. Ah, let's kick them out, trail of tears. It's a question of power and who has the authority to enact it and a question of greed and what happens when profit becomes part of the equation, right? That's what's going on. There is a long held belief that there is no realistic way for the Native American people to ever become integrated into a modern American society. Many Americans believe it'll never happen. These people are too different. You know, these people are seen as primitive. These people are seen as quote unquote savage and generations are gonna pass and they'll probably be every bit the same as they are now. Many American presidents Many American presidents, not just Andrew Jackson, as a matter of fact, all the way from Thomas Jefferson, believed that probably the best way to deal with the natives was to simply remove them west of the Mississippi River. Just send them out. Because you see, here's another problem that we've got to run into, a very unpleasant, very inconvenient reality, because you can't, you can't just decide that you're going to be you're going to be one way without thinking of all of the consequences that go with it. If we have, we'll say the Cherokee. And let's say that every year more and more white people are squatting on their land and clearing it. And there doesn't seem to be anything Washington is doing about it. And the Cherokee are mad. The Cherokee are furious. And they're constantly saying, look, we're trying here. We're farming our own land. We've got a, we've got a newspaper. We've got a written language. We, we want to work with you, but you can't keep stealing our land. And more and more white people in the local community are taking it. And every year, it seems like nothing is being done and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Let's fast forward one generation. Let's fast forward two generations. Let's fast forward three generations. Sooner or later, they ain't going to be in Cherokee, are they? Sooner or later, the Cherokee are just going to be gone. They will not exist as a people anymore if this pattern continues. 
because they're going to have no land, right? They're going to have no way to support their families. They will eventually probably integrate with the whites in one way or another. We know there's an awful lot of people now that are mixed race, right? The Cherokee culture, the Cherokee identity, the Cherokee as an independent race of people, probably in a few generations just is going to be gone if this process continues as it is. So if you were to go to President Jefferson or President Madison or President Monroe or President Adams and certainly President Jackson and say, there is nothing we can do to stop these white people from taking their land. And if this keeps up in a few generations, they will simply no longer exist. And that's a pretty immoral thing to do. What do you think they say are going to be the solution? Send them somewhere where the white people are. Just pack them up, move them away. They can have their own land far away from where the white people are. They can keep on being their race. They can keep on being their culture. They can keep on living their lives. And we won't have to interact with them anymore. Problem solved. You see where I'm coming from? Terrible, immoral. We're looking at it through the eyes of a president in the early 19th century. And understand, when you are actually the person having to make the decision, the choices you make are probably going to be very different than if you're standing on the outside judging them. You see what I mean? You don't get to kick down a barn until you have a blueprint to build a new one. And it's a horrible, horrible situation. And there's no winners here. Well, in 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. And you better believe the Indian tribes did not want to do this. It was an act that called for the forcible removal of the Western tribes, the largest tribal groups sitting on the largest amount of land. Some tribes fought this in court. Oftentimes, what would happen is a representative of the tribe would agree to move, but this representative didn't really speak for everybody. The courts actually ruled in their favor to some extent, but it didn't matter anyway. Up north, the Sauk and Fox tribes briefly fought against it, and this is an event we call the Black Hawk War. They actually took up arms to try to stop it from happening, but they were far too weak. One participant in that war was fighting, of course, for the government, and he was a young private, Abraham Lincoln. So yes, Lincoln helped participate in the Trail of Tears, even if it was in an insignificant way. Another private in that war was a young Jefferson Davis. So yes, Lincoln and Davis both fought in that war to remove those, those, those Indians, and they did not meet each other or anything, and they were not major players. They were, they were you know, not key players. Also in the 1830s, there were two separate attempts by the Seminole to fight this, and there were two Seminole Wars. Of course, and the Seminole were located in present-day Florida, and of course, in both cases, the Seminoles also lost. You know, they, they did not have the ability to militarily resist. In Tennessee, 2,000 militiamen were recruited to forcibly remove the Cherokee. They were led by a man named Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott was a officer, a veteran of the War of 1812, and we will hear about him later. Winfield Scott was originally from Virginia, but he later moved to New York, and he sort of oversaw the Cherokee removal. 1,000 of the 2,000 Tennessee militiamen that were recruited mutinied and refused to do it. And they packed up and went back home. And the letters written by these men was that this was too cruel. They were not willing to do this to people that they did not believe had committed a crime. And so, yes, you know, we don't necessarily think these Cherokee are like us, but they were not willing to do it. Some, some said that it was just horrible, you know, showing up on their farms and saying, you know, pack your bags, you're out of here. You know, one half of the Tennessee militiamen would not do it. They just refused to take orders and went home and it doesn't appear that anything really happened to them. You know, Scott didn't try to punish them in any notable way because it was not realistic. 
And I'm only pointing that out because this was controversial at the time. You know, there were a lot of people that thought this was horrible, this was cruel. A lot of other people were, you know, rubbing their hands together, free land, right? You know, let's do this, you know, greed, terrible thing. But by 1840, the majority of the major tribes had been moved to present-day Oklahoma. And, of course, the Trail of Tears was mostly over land. Some of it was over water. It was a horrible event. They were not taken care of on the way. The winters saw a lot of people die. Uh, it was as bad as it, as, as, as it could be. And let's just be honest, who wants to live in Oklahoma, right? I mean, you know, that's the, you know, they show up and suddenly they realize, wait a second, I got to live in Oklahoma. I mean, you know, we just can't, we can't have that. And considering the fact that I'm an Okie, in any event, the Trail of Tears was awful. Now, Jackson played a big role in making it happen. He, of course, was the president at the time. He fully supported it. And this is also a man who had crushed the Creeks earlier in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and so he certainly had no sympathy. But if we were to ask Jackson, why are you doing this? His answer would be because we are powerless to stop their extermination. You know, these white people are going to take their land. There's nothing we can do about it. And if they are going to exist as a people, we got to move them somewhere where their land won't be taken. Now, again, I can point out all kinds of ways in which that doesn't have to happen, but we're looking at it through the eyes of old Hickory, not people in 2020 who think they know better. Let's move to Jacksonian politics. Do we have time? Oh, we're almost out of time. I don't think we have time to get into it the way I want to. So we're going to talk about Jacksonian politics later on. So what do you say we just go ahead and call it a day? I want to, what's that? Sound good? All right, look, I want to remind everybody, um, remember, Module 4 is, we're in the second week of it, so start looking at that material if you haven't already and get ready to take the quiz. Uh, I am working on the exams, and so I appreciate your patience on that, and you all take care.